Jeanette, I've been wanting to talk to you since I heard about this quite legendary woman whose courage on the day, it really was, I'm not exaggerating, was just inordinate because you had the most horrific injury on February the 10th. Let's begin there and then we'll explore what else you've been doing since then. What happened on February the 10th in the Freedom Village? Yeah, um, a friend had rung me in my hotel to say, get your bottom down here. <laughs> um, we, things are kicking off. I didn't know what exactly. So I went to Freedom Village and there were supposed to be speakers on at 11 o'clock, but they weren't there on the stage. And instead, everybody was like forming a line. There was a line of police. All these police had appeared. The previous two days, we'd hardly seen any police, maybe a dozen, if that. And there was, you know, maybe a couple of hundred police all in a line. Uh, my initial thoughts were they were going for the tents, but I didn't understand why. There was a line of police, a line of people and all this other area, you know, 80% of it, the police could just go in and get the tents. So I was a little bit mystified. Uh, went in, uh, went front line. I meditate, I'm a healer, former bank manager, very calm, cool, calm and collected from talking to police officers over the previous two days at Wellington, because this was day three of the um, occupation, if you like. Um, I knew that we were allowed to stay there as long as we kept it peaceful. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want anybody on our side kicking off. And so I wanted to be there to just keep everything nice and calm and, and sing. I know that singing is really powerful for calming everybody down. So, so what happened when you joined that front line? Uh, a young girl said, come and join us here, we're, we're the chilled part of the crowd. And, and there was a young man there, officer, that, I mean, he's young to me, he might be young to everybody, and he smiled cheekily, and yeah. And there were a couple that rolled their eyes. And, and so for, all, yeah, for a couple of hours, we stood there and uh, we were singing different songs. Uh, you know, I forget what we sang now, but you know, the national anthem, Imagine. Um, I heard there was a secret chord, Joseph, played and it pleased the Lord. It was nice songs, sometimes Maori songs, but it was quite chill, quite relaxed. I wasn't really worried that anything was going to kick off because we're in New Zealand and because there were far more of us civilians than there were the police. So it never entered my head that anything would kick off. And also the police weren't in any kind of riot gear. Yes. So there were no warning bells to me. Um, and, and possibly fourthly, because the people around you were peaceful. When yeah, I went absolutely. there, they were peaceful. They were yeah. families. They were mums and dads with yeah, kids. There were kids there, cracking yeah. jokes. I've Young. seen uh, a Maori group plant a tree, a yeah. peace tree. So I didn't expect the police to turn in on us. It, it was just not on my frame of reference, really. Didn't expect it, and there was no reason for them to turn. Yeah, there's no the reason. Key. There was that no is reason. the key. There was nothing that I saw that day that yes. said these people need to be violently, brutally arrested. Correct. So Correct. what happened to you? Yeah, so what happened was as police reinforcements arrived, it was obvious the police were getting into formation. So instead of facing us chatting with gaps in between them, we then had a, a complete line of police officers and they all stood sideways onto us. Oh. Uh, so we were standing facing forwards or some of us were standing facing backwards, but they had the sides of their bodies. Now I realise that's probably a tactic because you're not going to take the injuries along the side of the body, but you will facing forwards. And so I was facing the police, not expecting anything to happen. I, I just thought we, we're holding the line. We're here lawfully, we're here legally. I'd spoken to two police officers over the previous two days and I'd said, are we okay to be here? Because I've never broken the law. And, you know, I believe that we can always work with the law, through the law to get, you know, to get remedy. Uh, the first police officer said, as long as you stay peaceful, you can stay as long as you like because parliament is the place you come when you want to protest. And that, that was a weight off my shoulders because, you know, I hadn't looked into these things back then. And then the second officer I spoke to, when I asked him, are we, is it okay that we are here? Are we here within the law? And he said, yes, you're here within the law, but the local bylaw of Wellington Council doesn't like the tents being here. So we would prefer it if the tents were moved. And I fed that back to different people, you know, within the organization that was there. Uh, but there was definitely a resistance to, to remove the tents. But as far as I know, that was the only transgression was there were some tents there and under the freedom camping rules, there shouldn't be.
That explains it really well. So that was in the two days leading up yeah. to this. So now you're just there and you're, yep. you're just lining up, you're singing. There's a sense of we won't let them bully us. Yeah. And I what happened? popped my, my ca- I would been filming on my camera. So I've got like two hours of filming on my camera, popped it in my pocket, zipped it up. And the guy next to me said, we're going to link arms. And he told me, put, put this foot forwards, that foot that way, a bit like you do it in a tug of war kind of, mm-hmm. so that you hold your ground. And so this guy next to me was facing forward, so I didn't think anything about facing this way. This guy, who was an older guy, faced the other way with his backs to the police officers. Yes. But, yeah, we were just creating a human thing so that I guess the police couldn't get through. That's, mm. that's, that's my understanding. Mm. But the joke was we weren't where the tents were. The tents were over the other side and there was no people there and the police could just go and get the tents. Yes. But there was this weird. There was this very much a kind of I call it a Gandhi peaceful passive resistance. Absolutely, and an emphasis on passive. When I was there, I never saw any violence from from the Kiwis who were there. Absolutely, you know, like uh, Perry Hacker, that kind of mentality where you know we're being peaceful, we're standing our ground, we know our rights, we've got the right to be here, we've got the right to peacefully protest. And talking with the police officers, I didn't see any aggression, whether it was physical or verbal, mm. from the protesters towards the police at any stage until, until we got to the very final day, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some stage. And I want to emphasise that a lot of the people there that I met had been mandated out of jobs. Absolutely. Their homes were wobbly or, or had been lost to them. Yeah. Many of them, it was actually their homes in their cars that they were there just trying to get their lives back. Yeah, to speak that, to this parliamentary yeah. group and say, you are ruining my life Absolutely. and I can't survive if you don't listen to me. And ripping the fabric of our society. So yeah. I got a healing centre in Oriwa. Mm. Um, I employed one lady, allowed another healer to work there free of charge and we were supporting, we were providing a healing service to our community. And then the mandates come along and I, I had to let it go. My landlord wasn't happy. He's lost a tenant. I don't think he's filled it since. Um, I had to let my member of staff go, you know, but I mean, there's far worse than the, I, I managed to do a lot of work online, but there's, mm. the people there in the main were professional, educated people. Yes. I met doctors, uh, firemen, Nurses, builders, teachers. engineers, teachers, you name it, they were there. Uh, social workers, people that really wanted to work, that were contributing to our society. But because of this tyrannical rules set by the government, which actually aren't lawful, um, I can go into that, but it might be a separate interview. And so you've got uh, a lot of businesses that have given certain instructions to their employees. And I think longer term, those businesses are going to be very vulnerable because the employees are going to be able to turn around and say, hey, you weren't allowed to do that. Yes. Yeah, but the businesses aren't realising that because they also don't know about the law. This is so already such a rich conversation. That's Section 83 of the Health and Safety at Work Act. Yeah. It says if an employer tells somebody to do something that results in injury, yes. then that person injured can come back and sue, personally sue the personally employer. Personally sue, not just the limited liability company, yeah. but actually sue the individual. So it doesn't matter if you've got a limited liability company, it will not matter. They'll be able to sue you in your role as the boss of that limited liability company. Or potentially or the principal of the school who's yeah. pushed it. Yeah, the or schools. The, the, the head of the, the tennis the schools club. schools will be screwed. Yep. Yeah. Anybody that's, you know, the owner of a cafe, if you've done that to your employees, you're going to be personally responsible. It won't matter the structure of your business because you can be personally sued. Mm. Let's go back to that day. So the police are all lining up, more and more of them side on to yes. you in a sort of a gr- an implicit aggression. Yep. You keep singing and you're now, thinking nothing will happen. That's right. The man next to me, who was a little bit more knowledgeable than I am, said, look, they've not got their hats on. And I hadn't really noticed this before. Uh, and he was right. And I thought, oh, that's just so that they don't fall off in the, mm. if there's a fracas, you know, somebody mm. doesn't run off with an officer's hat. Uh, I've since found out that's not what it is, that there's a different jurisdiction that applies. So the police officers are under one jurisdiction with the hat on peace officers, if you like, working for the people. But when they remove the hat, then there's a different emblem on the sho- side of their arm, on the shoulder, there's a coat of arms, and they're now under a different jurisdiction. And I don't think the police know this. I really don't. Otherwise, why aren't, this, why aren't they the same? We need why to get back same? to that. I think so we need fact, to do a bit of digging about this. Absolutely. I, I get the feeling we should do a secondary 
discussion mm. where you share all this prodigious research you've done. Yep. Because one thing about you that I'd heard, as well as your courage on the day, is your ability to research and dig yep. deep Absolutely. and stand your ground for your rights and the people's rights. And find the truth. What you're, is the truth? You're an incredible treasure, a taonga for New Zealanders. All right, let's go back to that day. So their hats are off. Now the hats are off. And so what then happened was the police pushed into us. We didn't surge in trying to get into Parliament or anything like that. We were just stood peacefully. And the police pushed into us. Uh, and I just stood my ground. But within... I'll just stop you there. Did you see the newspaper article the other day of police are so traumatised by the riots? It was the police who started the aggression yep. on both days and who were highly aggressive. Absolutely, 100%. They did this to yep. themselves and many people said that online. Yeah. Yeah. They are responsible. And, and what about the counselling for the people that were the innocent victims that were pepper sprayed? You know, there was a lot and traumatised just by seeing their mother, brother, sister, wife sprayed. Absolutely. It, it was horrific. Yeah. So they began the aggression so on they, the 10th they of began February. The, the aggression. And so what happened for me was I was stood there and um, it was very, very quick. As, as the police moved forward, I, I believe that I work with God. I, I work as a healer. I've got a healing gift. I used to be a bank manager in the UK. I gave that up to work for God doing healing. That's what I do. And so I said, um, God is with me. That gave me strength. And I said that three times out loud. And as I said it the third time, an elbow got placed on my windpipe really firmly cutting off my oxygen so with what air i got i said you're hurting me i looked at the police officer young dark haired she didn't turn to look at me now that worried me because you know i like to think if i was in that situation i'd want to see what damage i'm doing to somebody and are they okay and then she just dropped that elbow down to my sternum for a moment i felt relief and then immediately she applied a lot more force and i mean a lot of force um i'm a woman i've had two kids and i watch childbirth is but she was applying an excessive amount of force um, and she just kept pressing and pressing. I said again, you are hurting me. I said it really loudly, really clearly. I'm a public speaker. I know how to project my voice. Even in that mayhem, I said it really, really clearly to her. She still didn't look at me. She just pressed and pressed and pressed. And then I felt absolute sheer agony, just oh, pain like I have never, never felt in my life. Absolute hell and it doesn't go away, you can't breathe, every breath is agony. My God. Just horrendous, and I knew I was in trouble. My legs started to go weak. I wasn't, I thought I might pass out, but I didn't pass out. My legs just went weak, and as they did so, that got me away from the pressure of her elbow, so I let myself sink a little bit further, and, and I shouted out, I need medical attention, she's broken my sternum. I need medical attention, she's broken my sternum. I did not panic at any time. I was very calm, very peaceful, but I knew that if she kept pressing me, it would damage my heart and my lungs if they hadn't already been damaged. So I didn't know if they'd been damaged, but I also knew panicking wasn't gonna help. So I kept myself really, really calm. And then the next thing that happened was big arms. I got my eyes closed, I was focused on my breath because I was in such agony. Every breath hurt on a scale of 10, 10. Big arms lifting me out. So I presume that was men bigger, you know, six foot kind of men. The guys either side released me because it was clear I needed medical assistance and the paramedics were that side, not ours. So they didn't cause me any damage. But the officers, I've seen on the video since, there's a paramedic right there that they'd called to give me help. And he just stood by while the police twisted my arm up behind my back. No. Yeah, for real. You can see it on the video that two officers, one left, one right, twist my arm up behind my back when I've just said, I need medical attention. It's not like they'd arrested me. I was peaceful in the crowd. I've asked for medical assistance. And as they take me out of the crowd, they decide to treat me like I'm a criminal. And I've broken no laws. I've been peaceful. I've been there two hours. I've not been trespassed from it. I've just arrived, I've sung a few songs. Was my singing that bad? <laughs> Jeanette, I mean, I can actually viscerally feel that must have been the most agonizing pain. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Breathe. But then and on top of that, to have your arms back yeah. behind your arms is, yeah. and is opening this more. That's right, and you can see there's actually a thumbprint under my arm and there's bruises all down here on the, on the, on the photographs that I've provided. They really did a good job of twisting those arms back. A woman did this woman, to you? A girl. What was the pressure? Is it an elbow it's pressure? The elbow. Or, 
So the was she? Can was be she used. hitting? Any no, or just, just, just. She pushing. must have had the whole weight of her body on. A doctor's contacted me. A, a doctor that's been a, a doctor, a GP for forty years. She's rung me up to say, look, we don't know each other, but you know, really, she's seen what happened to me at Wellington, and she said, you need to know. I've been a doctor for forty years, and I've given CPR to countless seventy, eighty, ninety-year-olds who are in nursing homes, rest homes that are really, really fa frail. And you do have to apply pressure, but I've never ever broken a sternum. The radiographer at the hospital said she'd only ever seen two in 10 years. Usually it's a car accident without a seatbelt or it's a rugby indu industry uh, injury. I didn't expect going to Parliament as a peaceful protester on day three to be assaulted like this by somebody that is supposed to work for the police and is a woman. It actually Where? makes me feel quite nauseous. Yeah, quite, it makes you I, feel sick, doesn't it? It does. It yeah. makes me feel quite... Yeah. Um, and, oh, and, it's just a horrible thought. The, the question I have is, was she a cadet? She wasn't on that main line that I'd been chatting to for two hours. She wasn't there. And she, she was, was young too, was she? She was young. And I wonder if she was an inadequately trained cadet or a new police officer that was brought in at the last minute that didn't know what she was doing. My partner thought it, it's a martial arts practice it can be so he thought they were martially arts trained but when i've complained to the independent police conduct authority the one of the investigating officers there a guy called rod salt has said that is not a regular police practice but that investigation has reached a dead halt and what we now we're now in july i got injured on the 10th of february have we got any visual of this woman any yes i've got a photograph have. of it but no numbers because they didn't have their numbers on and they're supposed to have their numbers on their shoulders and they didn't. Those numbers are there so that we can identify them. And that's completely illegal. We should always be able to identify them. Yep. So that's what they did in the days of the Ghastly Red Squad in, in the Springbok tour days. They took their numbers off. Took the numbers because off. Because they knew what they were doing was yep. wrong. And so that was under that another. Was, they knew what they were going to do then because they'd taken their numbers off. And she will have to live with the consequences. I say this to all of those who were brutalized in Wellington. She will have to live with the consequences of this Absolutely. on her conscience. Uh, and, and this and will eat at her year by year. She, she will be liable both in her personal capacity and in her role as a police officer. Yeah. All right. And I am not a vindictive person, but we cannot change things unless we keep people accountable. So my job now is to keep all of those officers that either assaulted me or stood by and watched me being assaulted, they've all got to be held accountable. Including that para paramedic? The paramedic as well. I've made a complaint to uh, the Wellington Free Ambulance. I've sent them my video. I've heard nothing. So just for people who don't know what the sternum is, to realise how mm. serious this injury is, what is it? What part of the body So is it? It, it goes down here. It protects uh, your the lungs, heart your heart. Yeah, and it's really solid, all your ribs connect into it, but when it breaks, everything tears. You've got all the, it's, it's hugely painful. The doctor that rang me to say, hey, you need to understand how rare this is, she also said to me that when people are in a coma and the doctor wants to know how deep the coma is, they have different techniques to find out how deep. And the very final one they do is they rub the knuckles on the breastbone because it's exceedingly painful. Well, if that's exceedingly painful, imagine what it's like to have it broken. And it was the whole third, it's called the inferior third of my sternum that was, was broken. I just can't imagine what you went through. Every movement was agony. So let's go back. You're being carried by these brutes. Who no, not putting... carried, dragged. Literally, they dragged me at force. Oh, my God. They dragged me. One drags me by my arm when the other one's twisted up behind my back. And you're screaming, you're saying, please, I'm in... I am I'm... saying, I need medical attention, I've got a, bra I, uh, a broken sternum, I'm telling them. You can see from my face, I'm in agony, but one female police officer decides that I'm just a drama queen, and she voices that out loud. Oh my God, do we know her name? Don't know, don't know, I don't know who that lady was. I know she was stood to the right of me, but I don't know which one it was. It's probably one of those three. Words. She said she's just a drama queen. What so when, when they came to take me out of the crowd, her voice was saying, she's just a drama queen. And so then the fellow officers just handled me really, really roughly, incredibly. But the paramedic does nothing. And so I'm then taken, I'm dragged to an area, bent double. Uh, I'm not resisting arrest. I don't know I'm being arrested, to be honest. Uh, I'm in agony. I can't stand up. I'm in absolute extreme agony. I've a cop 
twist this arm up behind my back so I collapse to the floor. That's the only way I can go because I can't support my body. That does me damage. The paramedic then in his wisdom decides it will be a good idea for him and the male officer to lift me by my arms. Oh my God. It's just, like a stretcher should have been called. There's no oh shadow of a doubt. I should be on a stretcher. They don't know what the injury is behind here, but to anybody seeing a video, a layperson can see. In fact, I can tell you when I, when I uploaded the video to TikTok, they wouldn't let it show because it was too distressing content. So, Nick, <laughs> how did you even, a lot of people would have, would have passed out. I did pass out. After that being lifted up, I did pass out. So then the, police, the paramedic and a female officer then decide to do the same thing again and lift me again. But the icing on the cake is this. I've got the video, I've got three different videos of seeing what happened as I'm pulled out of the crowd. I've got the New Zealand Herald video, I've got the stuff video, I've got a video taken by a bystander that was up by the church. I'm, I can bear, I'm barely conscious, I can, breathing is an agony, I'm bent double, and the WPC that's with me, Constable Emma Smith from Porirua Youth Worker, she says that I walked freely, I sped up when I understood, an ambulance was coming for me, uh, and it's like, well, that's a lie. Where did she say that? Uh, where, well, they summoned me to appear in court, charged me with obstruction originally, and you have to get disclosure from the police. So on her first disclosure, she says she's a constable wo working with Porirua Youth. Yes. Um, and that I walked freely. She also says that that's she... That's perjury. That that's perjury. perjury. She perjures herself several times. She said she went there because two male police officers had me in their arms. That's a lie, because it was a paramedic and a police officer. Um, yep, and the way that she got my name was very underhand. I was bent double in agony. The paramedic had introduced himself. I heard her say, yeah, I'm here. My name's Emma, and what's your name? And I said, Jeanette. Now, up until that point, I'd refused to give the police my name because I understand a little bit about common law. Mm. And if you've not committed a crime, you don't need to give the police your Absolutely. name. Absolutely. You, you don't go silent on them, and I wasn't going silent on them, but I don't have to give my name unless I've committed a crime and I haven't committed a crime. So she so, sort of implied that she was a paramedic uh, in terms of my head's down, bent double, she's there with the paramedic and she asked me my name. Uh, that's a little bit dodgy. And then when she does arrest me, she charges me with obstruction and I say, what's obstruction? And she says, she didn't say anything, she just walked away. She didn't read me my rights. And uh, yeah, she then says in a written testimony that she charged me with trespass, that somebody else had told her I'd been trespassing and I had to be charged with trespass. But she said to me obstruction, all the paperwork said obstruction, so she perjured herself again. And I expect better of our police officers. What's really disturbed me though about this is on the second court hearing, because you go then again and there's more of a disclosure, she's a sergeant. So Emma Smith, that was just working with Porry Raw with youth as a constable, in the time between my first court hearing, where I, was, I thought I was charged with obstruction, but they changed it to trespass, and the second one where we were looking at the trespass charges has been promoted to a sergeant. And that really does need to be questioned. Okay, so I need to go back to the horrors of you being lifted up twice, not once, but twice, yeah. by different people, by your arms. Yes. When you're still trying to verbally say, I'm injured, my sternum is broken. Yeah. What happened then? You, you passed out, you came to... Yeah, I, I was laid out. I was probably out a couple of minutes, I think, looking at the video. Um, and then they get me to stand up again. And I, I have to try and do it myself because... I mean, they still lift me by my arms, but I know I've got to lift me with my legs. I w you can't imagine the pain. You just can't imagine So it. they wouldn't l listen to you? They wouldn't nope. hear you when you said, I can't nope. stand up? Nope. The lack of humanity. The lack of humanity. And I would also go so far as to say the paramedic was assisting the officers in arresting me. Paramedics should not do that. That is not the paramedic's role. The paramedic's role was to check me out. He didn't do that. The Wellington Free Ambulance needs replacing after a full investigation. It's disgusting. Yep. All right, let's go back. So you've right. somehow pulled yourself to your feet? Yes, and so the, the WPC then uh, led me to what I now know is the arresting area. WPC, Wellington Police Constable. Uh, so this is, is Emma Smith. Saying? So yeah. em Constable yeah. Emma Smith took me to the place. But, I mean, I was on hands and knees on concrete and gravel. Oh, 
oh in God. absolute agony. They offered me pain relief, but I didn't take it because I know I've got to go to hospital and describe to a doctor where I've got the pain. My you gosh. don't, you know, it's like if you've got a toothache, you don't have an injection before you talk to the dentist. So in so, offering you pain relief, was there a tiny was bit it. of kindness? Was there any, any no, concern? No, absolutely no, no. They offered me pain relief twice, but I mean, you know, you've got your bare hands on gravel taking your body weight for at least an hour. Plus you've got the sternum. I was, wasn't offered a blanket for under my hands. Are you okay? Can we get you something? My Would you like some gosh. water? Nothing, nothing. And she, Emma Smith decided, uh, the words that came out of her mouth was, there's nothing wrong with you. Now she's, I don't know if she's medically trained. She certainly didn't examine me. She's a police constable, not a paramedic. Who is she to say that? And I, I want to meet Emma Smith face, face to, face, to face. And I will do, and it will be in a courtroom. Yes because I will be holding her responsible for her part in this catalogue of errors that happened to me. Nothing justifies this level of Nothing brutality. does, no. And Where's the compassion, humanity? Absolutely peaceful, absolutely peaceful. What were you feeling internally at this stage? Were you feeling panic or anxiety or fear or were no, you uh, calm and focused? I'm very calm, very focused. I've meditated, I teach meditation. So it's a lifelong work. Every time I'm healing, I'm in a meditative state. So it was easy for me to stay calm, but I was concerned about what is the damage to my heart and my lungs. My God. Because I didn't know, and I've got, I've got children. Oh, I'm not ready to leave them yet. <laughs> that ambulance seemed to take forever to arrive. I, I know that I stopped filming at 1.26 and I got to the hospital at 3.03. .03. So that we've got an hour and a half there. The, the staff on the ambulance, I said, it's taken an awful long time for you to get here. And she said, we got here in 25 minutes. So somebody left me there on my hands and knees, not ringing an ambulance, either that or the ambulance records are wrong. My or gosh. it took an hour to go, is it three kilometers to Wellington Hospital? It didn't take that long. My God. Let's remind people watching this, this is for a woman who was singing. And I was singing, I was just singing the National all Anthem. All of this brutality. Yeah. I like police officers. I've had faith in police officers until now. Now I'm, I'm like this, but, but the, the officer that's been appointed so far to take my testimony, uh, my statement, you know, he's, he's a decent human being. I saw decent human beings there. But I don't understand why more police officers haven't stepped forward after what happened to report their colleagues. Absolutely. And so that's the bigger question is, you know, where are our good police officers now? Where are the Dixons of Doc Green and the good old Dixon of Doc Green? Where are our good police officers? Because if we can't count on them to turn in their colleagues, you know, if that bond of their brotherhood is, is stronger than their duty to New Zealanders, and then the we cannot point. trust and New Zealand police, and that's very, very sad. I totally agree with you. Mm. It's one thing to be open, openly thuggish and yep. brutal and, and, and absolutely behave illegally. Yep. It's another thing to look away, isn't it? You it are is. implicated if you look away. Yeah, and they've had time, you know, the next day, the next week, the next month to reflect on what happened. And some of those officers were way, way out of line. They were absolute brutes, absolute thugs but a lot of other officers that are probably good most of the time haven't turned them in and they need to turn them in. I felt really cross when I saw in the newspapers, you know, they want to find these 15 protesters. Oh, well, isn't I, it ridiculous? Yep. I want to find the police officers whose images we have, that they were the source of the violence. The protesters were not the source of the violence. What was the T-shirt before we started talking? You said you had on your T-shirt something. What was that yep. saying? Um, after I'd returned home, I was hanging the washing one day and I, I realised, oh, that T-shirt that I was wearing on the day, it's got words on. What do those words say? And it said, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. If it hadn't been me there, Liz, if it had been one of the older Maori people, a lot of our Maori older women there, really good souls there, they'd have been dead. You know, I'm fit, I'm healthy. Before COVID, I was going to the gym every single day. So what if it had been an older person? What if it had been somebody that didn't have the consciousness to just drop down a little bit on their feet? 
And what about the suffering afterwards? If what had been someone whose who's, who's mind had broken with the yeah. cruelty, the absolute open cruelty, yeah, that, psychological that's, brutality. That's the biggest thing I feel for mm. the people that were there is, you know, where is the counselling for those people? Absolutely. Uh, and all of those people are victims of crime and the criminals were the police on that day. So it's not just that you could bear that physical suffering and then the psychological suffering yeah. and the brutality and lack of humanity. Mm. You are such an extraordinary woman that you came through this and you have now been looking at rights and responsibilities Absolutely. and legal rights. Yep. Before we go to that, I just wanted, we left you at the ambulance. Yep. When you got in that ambulance, what did happen to you that day? Okay, so I'm in the ambulance and they say, where's your mask? And I'm not wearing a mask. And they oh say, my God. I say, like why? this is about health. Yeah, so I'm there with a broken sternum and I'm in an ambulance that I've waited an hour and a half for and they want me to wear a mask when I can't breathe because I've got a cracked sternum. So I do say, well, I have got a broken sternum and wearing a mask would not be wise. Well, you have to wear a mask until we set off. So I said, well, I'm not wearing a mask. I do have a mask exemption. They said, where's your mask exemption? Oh, my God. Wait, it gets worse. So, so I said, where's your mask exemption? I said, it's on my phone. So I, I unzipped my coat pocket with my broken sternum, unzipped that the lady did help me, lovely lady, but you know, we're still being, Programmed. we're still doing what we're told to do, not thinking about it logically and rationally. My phone's dead. So they don't set the ambulance off to the hospital. They look around for a charging cable and they charge my phone and they refuse to set off until my phone is charged and they can see my mask exemption. Oh my, Jeanette, this is, this, not there's okay. dumb, there's, there's unintelligent. Yeah, if I died then, who would be responsible? Because- And then there's be, this- And nobody would know, nobody would know because it would never come out, would it? And my, my kids would have lost a mother, my partner would have lost a wife, my parents, my mother would have lost, you know, but nobody would have known it was all because I wasn't wearing a mask and didn't get the medical treatment I needed. Crazy, eh? Now, while I was on the ambulance, I heard a police officer say to the paramedics, get some water ready, we're about to pepper spray. And I nearly burst into tears then. Those innocent people, teachers, uh, you know, dentists, <laughs> engineers, farmers that were, that, that have, they're there protesting everybody's rights and they're going to pepper spray them. That's assault. That is assault. And what was going to make things worse is the paramedics were only going to give them water when the people that were there had been telling me that if you do get pepper sprayed, you need milk in there. Oh. So the protocol that the police follow inflicts more pain. Oh my God. And so as I, as I left on the ambulance, that was what was happening. What happened in the hospital? In the hospital, I arrived at 3.03 uh, and in the hospital we were fine until the paramedics said, well, as we walked in the door, the first thing I got was, where's your mask? Where's your mask exemption? Mask exemption. Did they make you walk into the hospital even though you needed a stretcher? You couldn't uh, walk properly. No, I couldn't walk. I was in a wheelchair. So I was in a wheelchair and they, they took me to a place where you get triaged. But as soon as the police officer, the, the ambulance driver said that I'd been at the protest, you could see the nurse's body stiffen and I was left in the triage room for, I think it was another hour and a half before anybody saw me. And I was the only person brought in by ambulance. Two people walked in the door, they got seen before me. Everybody got seen before me. When that room was empty, then they saw good old me. Oh, Jeanette, it just, you're right, it just gets worse and worse. And, and I, was, worse. I was in that waiting room. I got one shoe on, one shoe off, because I'd lost a shoe. As they dragged me away, I lost a shoe. I was crying in pain. None of the medical staff came to say, you okay? Can we do something for you if you got worse? Nobody came. And none of the fellow Wellingtonians around me said, are you okay? Should we get a nurse? I was ignored because that was a protester. They dehumanized us, calling us protesters, they've dehumanized us. But I also believe it's very important we don't dehumanise them because those police officers are men and women just like you and I. They've been in untenable situations. They've been told they've got to have the backs. We need them on our side. And I was talking to officers throughout that time about that. You know, we were standing there for them, for their kids. 
you know, their family members that didn't want the untested mRNA. We were there for everybody. So, yeah, you're on our side. I fell on deaf ears. I said that to a lot of officers on that February the 10th too. Yep. We're doing this for you, you're our Absolutely. brother, you're our sister. Yep. I can't believe this is New Zealand. I can't believe those nurses in that hospital. No, unbelievable. Were so heartless. Unbelievable, yeah. I bet there are some who will be haunted as well in the future. Yep. How did you, my God, now it's been hours of this excruciating pain. Yeah. You've been horribly mistreated. Nobody has shown real compassion. Yeah. How are you holding up psychologically? I, I didn't. I think um, I did break down with, I thought she was a nurse, but it turned out I think she was a doctor wearing a, like a nurse's uniform. But yeah, because they were just turning me out onto the streets to go back to my motel room. Like, how was I going to go to the toilet? Wait a minute, what? They saw you finally after an hour and a half and did what? Well, they didn't they, put you in a bed they, in the hospital? No. What? No, they x-rayed me uh, and the x-ray was misread. So they thought I hadn't really broken it. Even though I said, look, I felt it break. I felt the bone break. They said, you can injure that and it can feel like a break. And I kept saying, I felt it break. Now, I'm not a person that's um, meek. You know, I'm, I'm not a meek person. I speak up for myself. And I was telling them, no, I felt it break. I've never broken a bone in my body, but I felt this break. Yeah, and, but when they turned me onto the streets, because I haven't got a car there. My partner's left me there, not expecting me to get injured. Nobody's with me. I have to go back to a hotel room. I can't open a door. I can't walk. I need a wheelchair. Jeanette. I've got one shoe. <laughs> I was a real pitiful sight, hobbling out into a taxi in the rain. One shoe on, one shoe off. I can't get in the taxi. The taxi has to open it. I have to lower myself into the taxi, not knowing if with this broken sternum, I'm going to injure myself further. There was no compassion. A third world country would be kinder than this. Yeah, it's crazy, eh? It's just absolutely crazy. Jeanette, I just can't believe this. Yeah. So what, he took you back to the hotel? So he took me back to the hotel. Luckily, it's electronic doors that open. Um, I dropped my key for the lift and I had to Did wait. Did you have money for the taxi? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm fine for that. I had to wait for somebody to come to pick up my room key so that I could press the button for the lift. Like anything, like pressing a button on the lift was painful. I couldn't open the door. There were two fire doors to get to my room because it's a big hotel. And I had to literally wait for other hotel guests to arrive. And then I had to go to sleep. Jeanette, you should have been in a hospital bed hmm. and monitored the whole night. I would have said so. I asked the, the nurse or doctor, whichever it was, I said, what if there's damage behind this? And um, can't you do something? Because I was thinking maybe they could do an ultrasound or, you know, CT scan or something like that. And they said no. And they just sent me away. Well, two nights later, I woke up in absolute agony. Like, I mean, I thought I knew pain when it happened, but uh, I got pain all around my heart. So wait a minute, you'd gone through two days of this, of... Mm -hmm. Of what, resting in the hotel room? Or what, who was looking I, after you? No, so the, what happened was that first night I, did, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep because there's no position that's comfortable. You can't, I can sit, I can stand, but I can't lie. There's no way in the world I can lie because it's just so painful. Um, so I was awake all night and I went on the internet and I decided what do I do and I decided I'd better report what had happened to me and I found that I had to go to the Independent Police Conduct Authority and I had to go to a police station so I, I um, what happened was nine o'clock in the morning my phone went it was the doctor at the hospital she apologized to say that they were so sorry I had got a fractured sternum the interior third was fractured um, having said that there was no point in me going back to the hospital because that kind of injury just does need to just heal naturally and it's about eight to 12 weeks. So I've got eight to 12 weeks of pain. Oh, God. I work as a healer. Anybody that's seen me healing, I wave my arms. I couldn't, I couldn't help oh. my clients with cancer, one of whom has died because I wasn't able to do healing for her. And that's what I have to live with because I, I work as a healer. And people find me when 
when they're at death's door, when they've tried everything else, they find me. And I've worked with this lady for probably three years. But I couldn't do her any healing anymore. She died. And so her kids are motherless now. That is not And so that, that is on. That, that is, is on the person that injured me. Absolutely. That's not my fault because I can't do what I would have done. That is on the ambulance officer who didn't do that with their dereliction of duty. That's on Emma Bloody Smith. That's on the woman who the injured, woman who it's injured on me. All of them. The woman all who injured me. Yeah. It is. So then you. You, so, you don't go back into so, the hospital. You now have to so self-manage your pain. So on that, yeah. So yeah. on that, so the hospital rang me and told me that. So what I did was, um, somebody rang me. Um, Voices for Freedom have been absolutely excellent. They mm. paid my legal bills. I didn't have money for legal bills. Mm. Uh, you don't make a fortune as a healer, as you can probably well imagine. Um, they paid my legal bills to a barrister to defend against the claims against me. So this is the sick part. I'm the victim, I'm the one that's been injured, but I'm the one that has to go to court charged with a crime that I haven't done, that's absolutely lies. So, you know, there's going to be accountability for that as well. So that day, having looked what I needed to do online, I go to the police station, a lady comes and picks me up and takes me to Wellington Police Station, which is a big ordeal for me because I'm in so much pain. A young man says, right, because this has been done by a police officer, you have to be interviewed by a sergeant. Wait in this room over here. He went to fetch his cups of tea, sat us in the room. He went off to find a sergeant. After 10, 15 minutes, he came back with a leaflet and said, do it online. Oh my God. I now thought we'd hit, I've ro read, I thought we'd hit rock bottom in, oh, in, no, in, it's, in the horrors. No, 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 we've got more yet. So he gives me a leaflet and I'm in shock now at this stage because I know it said I had to go to a police station. I didn't want to go to a police station. didn't want to see a police officer particularly. Found myself some support. I've gone there ready. I've braced myself ready to go in physically, mentally, emotionally and to tell my story. And they won't take my story. So then I said, well, can I at least have an officer to go with me to Wellington to identify the female? Because at that stage, I didn't know I'd got, I could get a photograph of her. I've got a photograph of her now, so we know categorically who it is. Don't know her name, don't know her number, but I've got an image and that it's a good enough photo image. We can identify her. So I'm sent away from the police station and I, I remember just sitting in the police car, in my friend's car, new friend, looking at the leaflet. And, and I've got the leaflet to show you, and it says you go to a police station. I've just been to a police station, they've turned me away. But when I asked for, can, you send, take, can an officer go with me to identify this woman while it's still fresh in my mind, they say we can't spare anybody. This is, this so, is so unethical. Then I get my friend to take me down to Wellington. She parks me really close so I don't have to walk far. I walk really, really slowly, and I find a sergeant there. And he won't talk to me at first, but I eventually get his attention and I explain what's happened with, with help. Somebody's with me there supporting me. And he says, you have to go to a police station. Oh, my goodness. So then I go to a Voices for Freedom table where they're helping all the victims. Over 90 of us were injured on that day, 30 seriously. In the newspapers the next day, it said that two police officers were assaulted. Nothing about the 90 of us that were injured. The 30 seriously, that means hospital broken bones, you know, a lasting injury, like there's people that can't use their hands, people with back injuries that they're still in pain. Jeanette, you know. this is horrifying. Yep. On that note, have you taken your story to the mainstream media? I've tried to. I've uh, contacted the New Zealand Herald the next day twice. I've twice more recently emailed the New Zealand Herald. I've sent them all the video footage, all the evidence, and they've refused to interview me. I've also rung Radio New Zealand twice, and on each occasion they've put the phone down on me. Radio New Zealand has Radio New Zealand like have put the phone down on me. Somebody tipped me off and said, they're doing an interview about what's happening at Wellington. You know, it's like a talkback kind of thing. You should ring in. So I did. The phone down was put on me. It was put down on before me. Before you even got to air, before anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Twice. 
with when no they realized, explanation. When they realised it was me again, they just put the phone down on me a second time. And at what point in the conversation, when you were telling this supposed journalist yep. the story, yep. at what point was that phone hung up? Uh, when I said that I was a protester that got injured at Wellington. That is our public broadcaster. Yep. That is absolutely disgusting and runs completely counter yep. to every tenet of good journalism. That's which right. is at least investigate a story and yeah. see if there's any substance to it. Yeah. That is not journalists. It's not. But that is propagandists who are working there. They've got 55 million reasons not to find the truth, because if they do report anything that is the truth, that is against the government propaganda, then they can have that 55 million taken back off them. There, there, there are so many layers of disgusting to this story. Do you want to hear the next level of disgusting? gets worse. You would think it couldn't get worse, wouldn't you? But Absolutely. it gets worse. All right, so having been turned away uh, by Wellington Police Station, having found a sergeant, I find the advocate. She that's linked with Voices for Freedom explains that the police broke the police code when they turned me away. So I did do, I was awake all night, I couldn't sleep. I did do my own investigating and I found that under common law, I could take my complaint to a senior judge. I could put my complaint to the senior judge of criminal law in the land, which is the district court judge. It's a lady called uh, Justice Susan Thomas. And if I put my complaint to her under the Imperial Act, I think it's 1933, she has to investigate because she's a judge and she knows the law. And not knowing if I could trust the Independent Police Conduct Authority, uh, because they have the exact same coat of arms as the police, so are they really independent? That's a good question that we can look at another time. I thought, well, that might be a better way to go. And all I needed to do that was a sworn affidavit signed by a justice of the police, of, of justice of the peace. And for a minute, my spirits lifted because the hotel where I was staying in Wellington, down on the ground floor was the Citizens Advice Bureau. So I thought, this is brilliant. I can, I can write me testimony, which I did on my computer, stood up, did my typing, that was okay. Take it down, I'd got my passport in my handbag, that was mm. another fluke. I can just get my signature witnessed and I can give it to a judge and the judge will investigate for me and we'll get this all exposed. Yes. And my understanding is, is that under common law, if the judge doesn't investigate, that judge is then an accessory or an accomplice after the event because they're part of the legal system. And so, you know, I, I hope that judge, Justice Judge Thomas, uh, Susan Thomas, will be on my side. So I, I do my affidavit and I go down to the Citizens Advice Bureau. And the Justice of the Peace at Wellington CAB refuses to see me and witness my form because I'm not vaccinated. Oh, good God. What is this, this country this is, coming to? This story is like a story in some kind of insane asylum. I'm writing a book about it because there's enough has, content for a book. Nobody you are turning to has a shred of integrity. No, or decency or common sense. So what did you do about that? How did you well, get a, a signature? Well, the first thing I did was I, I stayed as calm and as peaceful as I can. There was a woman dealing with me. There was also the Justice of the Peace. And I said, look, I'm in the VAX control group. Legally, whenever there is a, um, a vaccine of any kind, legally there has to be a control group. Where's Pfizer's control group? Mm -hmm. Pfizer have broken the law, not having a control group. And so I and a group of other people are in a control group, yes. uh, vaxcontrol.com, and I send in my health details every month wow. so that we're actually showing, you know, how the control group are health-wise compared to the vaccinated. So I'm part of that. That wasn't good enough for him. And it's like, well, this is a legal thing. It wasn't good enough this, for him. Could, could you have said, yeah. come and sign it outside? Or no. I'll hand the no. document into you? No. 
So he was completely just absolutely black and white. No, and he was aggressive. He was an aggressive little man. He was horrible. <laughs> and remembering, don't your, mind naming him that way. You're in front he was. of him, injured. I'm with and him. You're still and I've injured. said I've had my police off my sternum broken by a police officer yesterday. I've tried to go to the police station and report it. They haven't let me. I need you to sign this for me. I explained all of that. You're not vaccinated. I can't witness your signature. Unbelievable. I took that to the Human Rights Commission the next day because it was like, this is crazy. This really is crazy. But I, I would imagine he's the regular like, guy. To me, cowardice. He's scared that, that he might become involved in a complaint against the police. I wonder. Yeah, I wonder I don't what know, was driving that man. Justice of the police. He's a just. He's a justice of the of peace. the peace. He's supposed to do that. That's what they get paid to do. That should be taken away from him. That privilege. Yeah. It's meant to be for all yeah. Kiwis. So how did you get something signed? to get before the judge. Right. Um, I, it hit me that when we were in tighter COVID restrictions, I did have something witnessed by Justice of the Peace over the internet. And I thought, I will approach somebody in a Rewa area where I'm from and see if she'll do a Zoom call with me. Gosh, you're adaptable, aren't you? You're agile. I think <laughs> on my feet. You really do. So, yeah. So when that I'd love a photograph. And she was wonderful. She couldn't do enough for me. She explained the way that it had to be worded. She probably spent an hour and a half with me, didn't charge me anything as, as they don't. It's a service for the public. But she actually restored my faith in the justice of the peace system. Jeanette, that's about the first bit of human kindness that you've had going right through it this is. story. It is. Oh, this is really rugged. So with that um, justice who I hope came through from, for you, yes. have you got a photograph of her? Because there was someone who was a year ahead of me at law school called Susan Thomas. If it's the same woman, please tell me that she had humanity. I haven't heard from her. I sent all my documents to her on the 11th of February. We're now in July and she's not even acknowledged me. I sent her a USB with videos of what happened to me. I sent her my written affidavit signed by so I guess now I can include her in any legal proceedings I start. You said before she could be an accessory. She could be An accessory after the event because Absolutely. under common law, if we see a crime, we should go and report it. But we all have that duty if we see something. And a judge. A judge. With a evidence the most senior of judge. criminal behaviour. Yeah, absolutely. And there's been nothing. I mean, this is harrowing. Yeah. Did you say you're going to write a book about this? I am right. I'm about a third of the way through it. It's, it's harrowing to write it because I have to revisit it. I'm also going to include some of the stories of other people that were... Um, I, like, I like to think that none of the people that were injured at um, Wellington were victims as such. We, we, none of us have a victim mentality. We're all quite strong. But peaceful people who were pr protesting there on behalf of others we were doing the right thing. This government's doing the wrong thing. We've got a government that is passing laws that aren't legal. And I'll just give you some of the research I've done. We've got the Magna Carta of 1297. It's the one that King Edward signed. And that says that no laws should ever diminish our rights. The COVID Response Act has diminished our rights. Strictly speaking, that's not lawful, nor is it legal. Your message to Jacinda Ardern, I do ask Kiwis this, if you're comfortable, what would you say? I'm going to ask for two messages from you. One okay. to the head of the police, Andrew Costa. Yeah. But first to Jacinda Ardern down that camera as if she were here. Jacinda, I'm coming for your love. And Andrew Costa, the head of the police. Andrew Costa... $800,000 a year. My goodness me, you are going to miss that. That's going to be pretty painful. And I dread to think what's going to happen when you are the other side of the bars, mate. Hmm. You are one powerful wahine. <laughs> you are not cowed by them. You are not I'm scared. Not. And no, you're not the broken. truth will out. The truth will out. You know, what doesn't kill you does make you stronger. Where do you think this will go, Jeanette? Where are you intending to take all of this? All right, so there are two things. Uh, people have to be held accountable and we have to establish our rights. So my learning is that you and I, as, you know, as men and women, we have rights, but we need to express our rights. We need to be educated about our rights. They don't teach us this at school. 
To call ourselves a citizen, we then have diminished rights. We have the rights and responsibilities as a citizen. We're not, we're flesh and blood women. One of the things that has been really highlighted for me is when I've made my statement to the Independent Police Conduct Authority, first of all, the point I want to make is I reported what happened to me on the 11th of February to them in writing. It took them 12 weeks to even contact me. Having contacted me, they gave the police seven days to take my statement. The police took my statement. A really nice officer came out and took my statement. It's still not being signed because in that statement, they added a bit at the front to say, I am Jeanette Wilson. Well, Jeanette Wilson is my name. It's not who I am. I'm a spirit, a soul in a flesh body, and I'm known as Jeanette Wilson. But when they capitalize your surname, they turn you into a fiction, a legal fiction. I'm not a legal fiction. I'm not going to play that game. I am going to face up to this as a flesh and blood woman. And I'm going to educate a lot of New Zealanders along the way about how do we stand up for our rights? How do you ensure that your child isn't intimidated at school into wearing a face mask? Lots of kids do not want to wear the masks. Show me a kid that wants to wear a mask. None of them do. But they're all intimidated by the peer pressure. And so they're able to sustain this on us. Yeah, we've all got to grow a set, learn about our rights and, and do what we need to do. I was put in the position to receive this injury. It's not my intention to get injured. I had no idea it was going to happen. The only reason I was calm and peaceful was I truly didn't believe New Zealand police officers would do this to a Kiwi. Absolutely. How has your healing progressed? Since right. those awful um, days. I had, I would say, five weeks of continuous pain without a word of a lie. Can't open a door for myself, can't function. Um, really, really, really painful. Um, couldn't drive or anything like that. Couldn't do a steering wheel. Um, around end of five week, beginning of week six, it, started, it really started to notice. I, it, it, when it healed, it healed very, very quickly. But there was a lot of pain in the run up to that. And, I'm a person that painkillers upset my stomach, so I just had to grin and bear it. To New Zealanders who are still thinking this is okay, this country, yeah, it's seriously what would not. you say? It's seriously not. We have got a ty tyrannical government in power beyond any shadow of a doubt. And I'll tell you why we know for sure. If you had a legitimate government in power that were elected by the people, they would want to listen to the people. Yes. The fact they didn't listen to the people makes me question whether we've even got fair elections. And that's before we even look at all the horrors you've recounted here, which show yeah. a government that is willing, willing to allow absolutely illicit behaviour in this country and sanction it. Yeah. But when a government doesn't listen to the people, it yeah. no longer has legitimacy. That's right. And, and I, you know, I, you know it, it just hit me like a bolt of lightning that if it's a legitimate you know, democracy, then of course the government listen to the people. They can be safe not listening if they're not legitimate democracy. You see, all the MPs agreed together not to meet with us. It's disgusting. So as far as I'm concerned, they can all go. That's, mm. they committed treason against the people of New Zealand. It's treason. Do you need money? No. Because Kiwis would give you finance. No, uh, when I was down at Wellington, uh, people, I got a really good group of friends, followers, uh, I've got quite a high Facebook profile. Uh, people donated money to me that may, allowed me to pay my hotel bill. And no, there are other far more needy people than me in our community. So no, I don't need money. You are <laughs> just an extraordinary woman. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you, Liz. You are the first journalist to allow me to tell my story. Nobody's wanted to know. And that says so much about a country that is off, completely off its proper path. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you.